because Peter is actually working for ACIT. Uh, ACIT is a 99, since 1999, a registered uh, non-profit uh, association and uh, the competent center for IT security. Uh, so they serve a lot of public uh, bodies. So uh, be careful what you say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the Federal Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank and uh, the Grads and they are actually a, a, um, they are actually um, a part of or yeah founding their their members basically the Grads. Um, or there. You are you have been working on that. So yeah, yeah, that's very good. That's very good. I'm sorry for that. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I was I was giving a talk here uh, some time ago, as I said, and uh, I'm looking forward to his explanation regarding what is a blockchain, and because that's always confusing for everybody in the space. So thank you very much for coming. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. Hi, and welcome. Um, so, um, the first slide is exactly what Thomas just said. It's a short intro on ACIT. So, we have, ACIT is a non profit organization. Uh, members are Ministry of Finance, Bonus Lake and Sanctum, uh, the, the Nazanai Bank, and Gross University of Technology. Uh, and ACIT is focused on IT security. And since 2015, there is a 100% subsidiary, um, ACIT Plus. Um, I'm the CEO of this company. And we are strongly active in the public and private sector, more in the public sector, and we do a lot of things in IT security. Um, some areas down there, mobile security is a very strong focus of, our, of, of the company. Also, authentication things, cryptographic protocols on the technical sense, and then the organizational parts, IT risk analysis, ISMS, stuff, things like that. So, two examples. One example is going to be presented today. Uh, the, the cash register legislation that was done together with the Ministry of Finance. Another example for organization and stuff that I can partly tell is, for example, we did uh, with others risk analysis of the area system, of the health insurance system. Health, uh, system. So, um, also, what I think very important for us, we have close tie to the Institute, uh, with the, um, the IAK, uh, at the Graz University of Technology, and for those who don't know it, probably you know it since Meltdown and Spectre because a lot of this work is also done in the Institute. Um, so that's very important for us because we have a close tie to, to uh, the university and also to lectures. So actually I'm going to start a lecture on automotive security this summer. So we have a close tie here and I think that's very important to be on, 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 to, to provide um, very in-depth security concerns. So, um, first, blockchain. Um, did you know that? that I to the news today. So, print Bitcoin is uh, now probably was created by Rogue AI, and probably CI is not is created, was created by aliens. Who knows? Um, I'm just joking here, of course, but uh, there is one thing that I wanted to, to say here with this slide. And one thing that, that we all know is there is a huge hype in Bitcoin and on cryptocurrencies and on blockchain technologies. And what we see in consulting also in the public sector and also in the private sector, um, often it seems like there is the blockchain, let's find a problem where the blockchain fits into and it's very nice to have a blockchain in the company. Yeah, blockchain solves a lot of things, uh, but it doesn't solve everything and it's, of course, there are also a lot of problems that need to be considered and a lot of issues. Um, and one thing that I, I tend to do when I do a presentation on blockchain, I first start by um, yeah, defining the terms. And I think one thing that we should consider here that the blockchain, the term blockchain, was mainly created by the technologies used by Bitcoin. But if we look down those technologies, more into details of these technologies, we find out that we have a lot of tools in there, a lot of cryptographic tools, a lot of technical tools, um, and a lot of those, most of those cryptographic tools have been around since 20, 30 years, so they are not new. But what's very interesting, especially in terms of cryptocurrencies, we have um, yeah, those, th this new combination where we have those non-central uh, non 
um, behavior where we have uh, no central trusted party and where we can uh, do all these transactions. So, what I want to do here is to slide, just give you some parts. Most of you know those parts, but just want to do it for the, for the uh, talk, that, for the rest of the talk. So, one thing that all have in common, and that's very, very, very crucial for blockchain, is this integrity stuff. So, we have hash chains basically. We hash all the blocks and we, we link them together so that we have. Uh, those integrity checks and authenticity. For cryptocurrencies, of course, that was the main part of Bitcoin uh, introduced. We have those different consensus algorithms. And for cryptocurrencies, uh, proof of work, proof of stake, all those kind of, of, of different uh, functions. Um, but those are not all the, the algorithms, especially if you look into applications that are located in, that are used by companies or in the public sector. You don't want to have proof of work, and, and in most of parts you cannot do this at all. So you have some other more simpler consensus algorithms, and in the terms of cash register legislation, there is basically no consensus at all. I will tell you how this is uh, going to work. But that's a very, very important parameter that you need to consider. Um, of course, that's an easy one. Automated transactions. Do you have smart contracts? No, yeah, or we don't have them. And they're, of course, different types. I'm not saying that this is a complete list, it just should serve the purpose of giving an intro. And this is very important because uh, on Bitcoin or on cryptocurrencies we typically have more or less public data, so we, we know that there's a transaction ongoing. Um, but actually public data is not very, very, very interesting for a lot of applications because we have very sensitive data in some, time, some cases in there. So sometimes we put in plain data, sometimes we just put in hashes, sometimes we put in encrypted data. Um, whatever the decision is here, we need to be very careful that we still serve the purpose of providing the transparency to others that are within this public ledger or the private ledger that's being defined. That's something very important because um, that's very interesting, of course, for cryptocurrencies, but not always available. We have assets in there, we have coins in there. But in certain applications, we don't need any assets. It's just for providing transparency. And um, the private key, of course, is a very important part for if you have assets in there, how you deal with this private key, you know, with those private keys. Um, that one here, access to the blockchain, um, that's also very important because we want to read something or to write something. In some cases, we want to delete something. That's, of course, sometimes not so easy. But um, is this publicly available? Is this in a private group? Um, yeah, and, and who has access rights? And, and what are different entities that have access to the blockchain? What are they allowed to? Are they only allowed to verify certain data? Are they allowed to write into the blockchain? What are they allowed to use? And that, that depends on the application. And that one here, I think that's a very, very, very important part. That's, um, at least in my, my experience, when we give consulting, we do consulting in this area, Okay, there is a problem, let's use the blockchain and we've solved everything. No, um, there are some fundamental, fundamental problems that are not related to blockchain at all. That's standard organizational and technical processes that have been around for a lot of years. So, in most of the cases we need to have some key management if we use assets. Also, if we have uh, different um, in the consensus algorithms, we have different signature uh, keys and, and things that sign the blocks. We definitely need some key management in there. Not in all purposes. On Bitcoin, the key, manage the key management is not relevant. If you lose the private key, it's gone. Um, but imagine if you use Bitcoin for your, let's say, I don't know, bank account, and you lose your private key and the bank account is done, it's not going to work. So it works for Bitcoin, but it doesn't work for other things. We have trust management. Um, in certain cases, we really want to trust the other party, and probably this trust should be established. That's no, it's not the Bitcoin way, but in some cases we need a central party where we have trust in. We, for example, if you pay and have a terminal over there with your NFC card, uh, you want to trust the terminal. And the card needs to know what's a trusted terminal and what's not a trusted terminal. So you have trust management that you need to consider, not for applications but Probably you have identity management that was also uh, 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 mentioned by Thomas. You have identity management regarding the the assets and, and, and persons that um, yeah, are, are within the chain. Of course, we have a lot of compliance things to consider, uh, especially now that the data regulation 
a protection regulation is um, upcoming. So what is if we have some personal data, put it somewhere into the chain and then we need to delete it again? Now um, that's going to be a problem of course in some cases. We need to consider other compliance issues. We definitely need to have some crypto management in place. We need to deal with uh, broken algorithms, with uh, lost keys, with broken keys and all that kind of, those kind of stuff. So what um, if you have a small consensus and for example some nodes are hacked, how do you deal with the, the key exchange and, and, and uh, key screw mechanisms and all, all those kind of stuff? Um, okay, key management is it's so important, it's here, second time. <laughs> um, that's the data regulation uh, uh, protection. And uh, also, of course, if you do this, for example, in, a, in the public sector, but also in the private sector, you need to operate this thing, and you need organizational processes, and you need technical processes to deal with the blockchain. So, that's not, a, not the whole set, but at least gives you a perspective that we can uh, separate into little tools and, and have a, a tool set for each application. That's the reference for Bitcoin, a very short, short one, so we have hashes, yeah, we have proof of work. We, we don't really want really real smart contracts, we have plain data basically in there. We have private keys for the assets. Everything is basically public. Of course, we need to, you know, we cannot directly write in the chain, but it's public. And, and that's, that's very important for Bitcoin. We don't have anything of that here. In certain cases, it's not needed. We don't need to consider the data regulation protection, uh, the data regulation. But we don't have key management, trust management, and identity management. If I lose my key, it's not. Um, and that's fine for Bitcoin, but not fine for us. So, and now the, the main topic of this talk is, of course, the base three cost sicherheits for the RKSV. So um, I'm going to use some German terms also in there because uh, some of those terms I, I cannot translate into really English. I don't know English terms. So um, that's. Since April 2017, uh, we see those QR codes on the receipts. And what's the, the tools that are here? I will explain the different tools. Of course, we have still we have some hash chains. It's not a cryptocurrency, definitely not. We don't have a consensus algorithm. We have uh, secure signature creation devices in there that uh, create authentic signatures on the blocks. We don't have any smart contracts in there. Um, we have plain data and encrypted data in this chain or on the receipts. Um, that's a little bit complicated. We have different writing to this chain is only allowed by the vendor who has this um, or has the private key. But reading from the receipt, it's uh, partly public. You can all read the QR code and, and parts of the data on the receipt. But um, certain aspects can only be read, uh, be read by the Ministry of Finance. That's the turnover counter, how much money was uh, is in this cash register. And also different s certain state information on the cash box whenever you go, I don't know where standard, but if you go to, to Finance Online and then you register the cash box, then there are different states in there. So, uh, and on the contrary to Bitcoin, all those things here are very important. So key management was important, trust management is very, very important here. Identity management is very important. You need to know the, the company that's behind the receipt. Compliance issues, of course, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, <laughs> that's law, but also there are other regulations that need to be considered in order to be compliant. Uh, we have crypto management in there and key management. It's not said that, that those are features that we uh, always need to put in, in this case. So, what is it about? That's a, a receipt here, you have seen them. There's a QR code on there. What's in the QR code? Um, short intro, and now you want to We have a cipher suit here. Basically, this uh, uh, indicator here tells you that this is the cipher suit, the first cipher suit, and it defines some cryptographic algorithms. And the second part here, that's the trust service provider. So, we have three in Austria now the A Trust, Global Trust, um, uh, and Prime Sign. And this is the first one here in this case. And if it's a zero, then it's a closed system with something different. We have um, uh, a cash box identifier, cash register identifier, and a um, receipt identifier that's also on the printer. It needs to be printed here so that it's visible. We have a date in there, and then we have the different uh, positions, um, sums of our different tax sets, so for 20%, 10%, whatever tax sets we have in Austria. 
Um, and then we have an encrypted turnover counter. So this is encrypted by an AES key, yeah, AES and TXT and ICN mode. So that's why we get very short. Uh, not, we don't have to have, have to complete AES block with 128 bit. Um, that's the serial number of the signature certificate that is used to sign this receipt. And with this, with this information and this information, you can go to the public uh, directory service, the other service, uh, and retrieve the certificate which you can then use to verify the signature of this receipt. Indeed, there are apps out there, eBilly is one of them, you can download them and verify the, the signature of the receipt if they're correct. And this one here, uh, that's the, the chaining value, so that's the hash code. It's not a full hash code, but it's a little bit shorter. Um, that links the, the different receipts. So, basically, that's the the blockchain, <laughs> we have different blocks here, uh, one block is a receipt um, and the, the next receipt is cryptographically linked to the previous one that goes on and on and of course the, the turnover counter, if you have 10 euros on this one, 20 euros on this one then it's here it is 30 euros and, and all like that so it starts with zero if you initiate the, the cash register so that's for the integrity part, so it's a hash chain like uh, we have but there are no complex side chains and things involved. It's only one chain, their cash register. Um, consensus. There is no consensus. Um, not really. But um, how, how is a block signed? So there is an important part here. So there is a big PKI, a public key infrastructure behind those signature uh, stuff here. Um, so the certificate, certificates that are used and these private keys that are used to sign the receipt. They, are only, they can only exist in a secure signature creation device in, in hardware and you cannot extract them, you cannot create them on your own of course during the registration process but they are always in hardware so you cannot fake them, you cannot clone them, you cannot extract them those are standard payment chips, crypto chips by NXP, by Infineon, whatever you have out there and there you cannot extract them um, so, Every block is signed with such a private key. Each company has a private key or multiple private keys if, if there are multiple signature devices. Um, so, and every block is signed. So, it, now there's one important question. How to ensure that the chain is not rewritten later? Because if we have 100 blocks in there, when does it okay, I'm recreating this and leaving out some internal. Well, um, we have, I don't know if you know that, but we have a law in Austria since the last time. It's mandatory to issue any receipt, and it's also mandatory to take it. So, um, the typical question, is not uh, really valid anymore, at least on paper, I don't know how much this is checked in reality. So, by having that, you have to take the, the receipts, you have to issue them, by that you create public verification points, because whenever you hand out a receipt, as a vendor, you need to assume that probably the Ministry of Finance or probably someone else checked the, the receipt and thus has a, a public verification point of the chain that it's created. Um, so, that's for the for consensus, um, for part of the consensus. So, that's what I already said. So, you don't have a software key store, only hardware key stores, and those certificates are issued by trust service providers according to the European regulation on signatures, uh, electron, uh, regulation, uh, electronic identification, authentication, trust services. So basically, every trust service provider that is allowed to issue a qualified certificate, a certificate which you can use instead of your handwritten signature, is also in theory allowed to, to publish uh, cash register certificates. Um, so this can be any trust service provider in Europe. Currently, there are only Austrian ones, but it's also open for the market. So other European public providers could just provide signature services or certificates. So um, that's the certificate. So if you want to check that, you can read about this on the RTR webpage. And also, there is a trust list up there which tells you which European trust service provider hands out qualified signatures. And yeah, basically, it's a lot um, in general to do that. So, what we have here, so if we have a vendor that gets a certificate, the registration process at the trust service provider and all the compliance issues and technical issues and organizational procedures at the trust service provider ensures that the certificate is only handed out to the 
to the right render. And the smart card or the sample, because you can use it on a smart card, and you can use it in a remote system, on an HSM for example, um, ensures that the key cannot be extracted. And it's not possible for the vendor to say, oh yeah, there was someone who stole my certificate, my key, and he used it. Of course, if he loses the smart card, and if he doesn't um, do the authentication procedure the right way, yeah, then, then he might have to that's, that's it. So, what data is in there when it shows us that we have public data like receipt ID, cash register ID, everything that you see here. Uh, the certificate is not included because that would be too long, so there's only the serial number and you can retrieve it from the public directory services. And there's encrypted data, the turnover counter, like I said, it's with AES and IC in the ICM mode, and the AES key is only known to the vendor and to the Ministry of Finance. So, whenever you register a cash box, the AES key is registered there, and so. Ministry of Finance and the vendor is able to decrypt those turnover counters. What's not on the receipt said that before there is some state information whenever you register. Assets, we don't have any assets there, there are no crypto coins, there's not a private key for, for accessing those assets. Um, but in a sense, you can say that the AES key for the turnover counter is an asset, but yeah, not in the crypto assets. Um, who is allowed to write to this blockchain? Um, yeah, of course the vendor, only the vendor, because only the vendor can create authentic receipts with the signature certificate. Um, and read, yeah, the public can basically read everything that goes to the public. Um, that's, there's no private information there. Um, and private information is the turnover counter and the state uh, within the Ministry of Finance that can only be read, read by the Ministry of Finance. Um, key management, uh, yeah, that's very important here because you don't want to be able to count the keys, you don't want uh, all those kind of things, so we have the signature, secure signature creation devices, and we have all those standard PKI methods involved, revocation lists, CAs, trusted uh, parties, and all those kinds. So that, that's completely different from, from Bitcoin, of course. Um, and, and the registration and deregistration, apart from the revocation, can also be done if it's online. You go there, deactivate a, a, a signature device, and then, of course, it's, it's not good. <coughs> trust management, yeah, of course, that's very important. Only trusted CAs are in there, only those trusted CAs are in but they have listed trust service providers, so it's not possible for anyone to bring in its own PKI or its own key or its own certificate. Only those that are issued by the trust service providers are um, identity management, yeah, of course we need identity management in there because we need to know who the vendor is. So whenever you have a receipt, you need to uh, be able to identify the vendor and that's done by this registration procedure. And we also have uh, the, the UID uh, or uh, the showing, uh, text number in there depending on the company or the GLA. So that's using the certificate and so you can uniquely identify the vendor. And that's done by those apps that are out there, eBay for example. I look up the URLs of the companies, it's all the information. Yeah, compliance, a lot of compliance is in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, because the Kazlik has fallen of course because that was created by that. All this upgrade one, all those other kind of laws. So there is a lot of things that need to be considered for compliance here. Of course, a lot of more, a lot of more compliance issues than we have in other systems. Crypto management, yeah, that's the thing I, I meant before. We have a cipher suit in there, so if one of those algorithms get, gets broken or if something needs to be fixed because there is some kind of problem or it turns out there is a problem, then there will be just created another cipher suit, for example, R2, and there will be probably another signature algorithm in there, another hash algorithm, another AES. So, for example, if we would have used J1 five years ago, and yeah, then this would have been just replaced with so another hash algorithm. Uh, by changing the cipher suit. And that's written, you can read it as in, in the forward in the legislation, and the cipher suit is defined in there, so you need to be up to it. Um, just to give you a whole picture on that, so that's the thing you receipt. Um, how does it work? So if you have a cash register and you need, let's say, it's not a single blockchain, so if you call it blockchain, but it's per cash register. So a cash register has a starting point, and the starting point is the so-called start receipt. You set the turnover counter to zero, 
um, you link the first hash value to a cache register ID, so basically you hash the cache register ID, and that's the, the initial receipt, and everything is zero on this receipt. And what you do is then you go to Finance Online, register your cash box with ID 1234, you have that in your first receipt, the same ID, you have registered a signature creation device with a value certificate, and then you submit this, you can do this manually or via, via an API provided by Finance Online. Um, and what you can do now is uh, you can use an app to uh, scan the first uh, start receipt to the QR code and then the Ministry of Finance validates uh, if the start receipt is correct, if your signature is correct, if your turnover counter is correct, then it's also a kind of validation that you have done the right thing. And that's the starting point for this cash register. And whenever uh, you write a, create a receipt, you link um, to the second receipt links to the first, third receipt to the second, and so on. Um, and you write all those receipts in this start my fastings protocol. This structure here is JSON web crypto format, so that's the header for the algorithm information, and that's basically the base64 value of the of the machine readable code that's on the QR code. So and all those are linked together. And now you have certain things. You have a chain, each receipt is signed with the certificate. Of course, there, there are also some well, things in there. If you lose the link or the smart code is damaged or not available, you're allowed to skip some certain signatures, but not but, but only for a certain amount of time. And the, the chain still goes on, so the, the cryptographic chain is still there. Um, and what you have here, whenever you hand out a receipt, you create a, theoretically a public verification point. So let's say this receipt was checked by someone, or by, by the Ministry of Finance, for example. Um, then this part of the chain cannot be changed anymore because we have never read it anymore. Um, that's the one thing and um, also you need, you, it's mandatory to create uh, every year a um, uh, yeah, so-called yearly receipt and there's also is a termination point for validation point for this. For this uh, so, for each cash register one, one of those starting process. That was the, the part of the cash register thing, so I just have two couple of slides more, more in general regarding blockchains. We can, of course, discuss uh, cash register things later if you have questions. Um, but I want to still tell you this, I'm like, okay, we have cryptocurrencies and we know pretty really well what's there and, and that they have certain uh, properties. Um, but what, what's happening is that, especially, on the management level, somebody gets the term blockchain and then I have experience in that, so I really saw it. And then, yeah, we need to use blockchain. And, and there is an application, and blockchain needs to be integrated in this application because it solves everything. And so, um, for all those kinds of applications that are not a cryptocurrency, we really need to be careful because the Bitcoin tools is not going to work in 99% in of these cases. If you don't want proof of work, you don't want to have private keys that can be lost, uh, you don't want to put all data in there, you're not even allowed to do so. Mm -hmm. So that's... Um, so every application basically will have a unique tool set. Probably not from the, on the cryptographic algorithms, but you need to be very careful what you put in there, how you transform the data, um, what you store in there, how you deal with compliance issues and, and all those kinds of things. So basically, you need to use some kind of such a metrics. Use, for example, you can use existing frameworks like multi-chain, uh, Ethereum frameworks, whatever, but you really need to adapt them and you need to transform your data and, and take real care of that. Um, so, and I think one of the mentions there are some questions here. If we, we have such an application, I think we really need to ask first, how do we achieve the desired transparency? So let's say, let's use an example. Um, if we have, if we track, let's say, where meat comes from, from the farmer going to the supermarket and all those kind of things. Okay, we could put that in a blockchain. That's, of course, a nice part because most of these things can be public. But uh, if we, for example, use it, I don't know, for e democracy purposes and, and all other purposes where you want to prove, provide some transparency either to the public or to a small consensus, 
you really need to be careful what you put in there. Um, and also, you need to be very careful on the side channels you create. Because, for example, if you have a public chain on, I don't know, meat uh, product chains, and the side channel would be that you are able to find out how much meat is produced by one company and by the other, so then you have side channel information. So, and that's also some kind of um, a competing goals, because you want to be transparent about some things, but you cannot be transparent in all things. You're not allowed to, you don't want to, and you, you cannot do that. So you need to find a middle way. And even if you say, okay, let's encrypt this data in there, you need to make sure that all those who are allowed to access the data can decrypt that again. You have, again, key management and all those kind of things. Um, so, yeah, we need to deal with all this cryptographic material, we need to deal with public, uh, with privacy issues, with compliance, and here's some things more that, that, of course, we need to consider for such an application. The consensus algorithms is very important, but um, considering we have, let's say, a very simple consensus algorithms where we have, I don't know, let's say five nodes to, uh, on, on different entities, let's say public entities. What you need to do is, you need to really have contracts with all those public entities, those who operate this thing. You need to have service level agreements, so you need to deal with the cryptographic keys. You probably need to invest in HSMs so for signing. So because they are very important, they are much more important than one miner in Bitcoin. They are really important if you have a small consensus, for example. So um, you, you can skip the organizational stuff and you can skip all this cryptographic stuff. So that's, I think, that's one thing that, that you really need to consider. And one other part, um, you know, it's not even here, but I think what is also very important, you have probably some underlying technology like multi-chain or any other framework. And I think what you need to do is, if you have an application, you need to have some kind of middleware that's pluggable, so that's able to hash data, to encrypt data, to use different blockchain structures. So you need to be very flexible to adapt the toolset that you have to the application um, you need. So, um, that's the, the, um, the keynote on that. Um, I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. Um, so, this blockchain regulation and chaining all the transactions in the, in the cashier system is all fine and good, but how does that prevent uh, the business from still channeling income to the side by not issuing a, a receipt at all? Yeah, <laughs> that's where the legislation comes in that you have to issue a receipt and you have to take it. And that's but something is this that's controlled in any way because other countries did some sign of lottery. If you enter yeah. a ticket, yeah. uh, uh, a, a receipt ID yeah. in the system to, to win something. Okay, before we go into details in here, um, I will not be able to answer all the questions because I, those have been policy decisions that where we, we were, were only involved in this technical part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. There's a lottery somewhere because you, you have this public incentive to do so. We also have this mandatory issuing and taking of receipts. Yeah, and, and of course that is of course validated by the Ministry of Finance. Um, but yeah, if it's two in the morning and there is a restaurant and a couple of beers and whatever and they don't hand off receipts, nobody's going probably not to know this. Thing. But on the other hand, think it that way as the society, whenever you don't get a receipt, you really um, have a gift for the vendor because the tax set those 20%, that's a gift So um, for the vendor because those 20% are not paid taxes, but you pay to the vendor. So. Yeah, um, of course, if we design it from scratch and use all the possible ways we can do, and also you need to consider from a policy point of view, what can you do to which like having um, other countries have a central system where all the receipts are generated. Yeah, you need to have you have policy issues here also. If you want that, if you don't want that, how much you want to, uh, yeah, go into the business of the companies. So, but yeah, I cannot give you all the answers because it's policy issues. Decision. Can I ask a <coughs> different question about yeah. the security of the system? Yeah. Uh, I think there are. In the middle of individual AAS keys for every cash register. So if I crack one, I only get, for instance, the information of his. They are generated by the vendor. 
and uploaded by the vendor. Or by the yeah, system. Per C? No, not per C. Okay. So, but it, I, I guess it's, it's, uh, it's safe enough the 128-bit AES key. It's, so it should it's be a 256-bit AES key. Okay. Uh, even if it's 128-bit, it's, it's secure enough. And also, because even if you have the turnover counter, that's one turnover counter of this one cache box. Yeah, I was just it's thinking because if you have uh, your concur uh, concurrent Concurrent, I am not getting the English right now. Uh, so you could technically get the turnover from the. Yeah, what you, of course, um, if somebody uses a weak AES key or public AES key because that's already known because he always uses the same or the system uses the same, you could go to, I don't know, Schwabin or whatever you go and then look at the cache yeah. box in the morning and then in the evening and you know for this one cache, cache register how much turn Either in individual per Individual. Oh, okay. For each cache register you need to have an individual okay. key. So it's even if, if you would attack it, it's not that bad. And then, yeah, if the vendor decides to use the same ES key for all and, and, and probably pins it to the cache register. <laughs> but it, <laughs> it's his own. Yeah, in the security also. Um, is this a mechanism for backward security? So if, if you said if the security um, algorithm is broken, then the cipher suite changes, but you have the information all theoretically all the old to be okay. Yeah, but what you would get is you would get the turnover counter, that's the only thing you get this. Mm -hmm. But okay, I assume that AES is not going to be broken in the next couple of years, but still you need to you consider such cipher suite stuff and, and crypto management. Even if it is just for changing minor parts, like say you need to change the format, then it's not related to crypto, it's better yeah. to crypto. The, the weaker crypto is probably anyways the ECGSA signature, right? Which part is it? 256. Which is the standard? Is, uh, what's the standard? Yes. The least curve. Okay. Um, and my question would be um, the. Uh, what's my incentive as a consumer to check these QR codes at all? Because I, no, I would yeah, guess right. it's an incentive for, for my competition to check on, on their competition and say, oh, look, they there are manipulating no, something. There is no system in place in Austria, like you said, like this lottery where you get a uh, scan a receipt and then you take part of the lottery and then you can able to win money. That's not there. So there is no incentive and this is the app. That's out there, as I mentioned. That's a, a private app. It doesn't do anything. And it cannot even report anything to the Ministry of Finance. It's just well, I, that's a I mean, private that, that would be that would be the ideal use case for the Ministry of Finance to get as many QR codes as possible because that's yeah, how they can check. But then they'd have more work. <laughs> <laughs> that's something I, I, I cannot comment because that's a whole issue. That was all those kind of things are defined by the, the, the legislation part. But it's not technically related, so I cannot give you it's an answer. Nice solution, but but yeah, you are, you're right. You can you just you can even do something like Pokemon and find those monster receipts that are completely <laughs> wrong. <laughs> or maybe there is some maybe someone is going to do it. Sort of strong. We can do some, for example, I like to pay yeah. something, and then I try to find. Oh, sorry, I've lost my wallet, and they you already printed the receipt. Yeah, yeah, that's, the, yeah. yeah. that's a yeah. specific tag, and you just you can have store on the minus way, but also in the positive way because if you have a, a voucher or something and you cancel the voucher, then it's minus. So yeah, that's then it, it's uh, going. There is a minus uh, uh, subtraction from the terminal account. And how I was made sure that like I, I just uh, store a few months later when maybe the, the people who uh, the receipt already checked it's all okay, and they just store it two months later. That's no problem because it's um, there's and then, no no he, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of a fraud. He, he, the customer doesn't come back. It just it just okay, swallow it, it from from for me and put the money back into my pocket. Yeah, yeah but then you, you need to do this in the in the chain because you probably want to do this in the chain because otherwise you have a too big turnover counter or turnover yeah. value. So you need to do it in the chain, and then if you do this. For one receipt, okay, but if you do this in a way that it really helps you, then um, it would be considered as strange thing to have a lot of stores in, it, in this uh, 
that the fuzzy So in, in the end of the year, you upload the whole log? No, only one percent. Only the last one. The whole log is never uploaded. That's only if you have a... You don't need to upload the whole log. If you have one validation point, the whole log before cannot be changed. Yeah, but then you only know the, the final balance, and then you can go yeah, but on the 31st of December and say, ah, oh, I made a turnover of 200,000, no, 150,000. What? Well, you're not able to do that. Because if you could just uh, do a spawn of transactions until you are done. Yeah, but that's in the chain. You cannot change the chain before. And if you assume, you hand out receipts, and you need to assume that there is, let's say, not the public, but a mint. Employee of the Ministry of Finance who has checked it probably or has your already subject to something like that, then you don't know which validation points are in there. And, and, and one thing that, so the, of course, what you still cannot do, even if you have it like that, and you know that you didn't hand out any receipts, um, faking all that still requires, and then you have also statistics. Things. So that's not the only security mechanism. But, like I said, there are many policy decisions that just can be done, not involved in the others. We, we just work together with the, to, to clarify that, we work with the Ministry of Finance to provide demonstration codes, to provide the validation tools, and, and to use security stuff on the technical issues. In various Austria place compared to other countries when it comes to the solution? So what are other countries doing? Are you using the same technology? Or? I don't know so much How about you yours. Are you asking for implementing this in other countries? So. Um, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I don't know too much about all the systems that are out there, but they are completely different systems. For example, I know that uh, from Mex in Mexico it's like that every receipt and every uh, uh, thing is signed and, and reported to the Ministry of Finance. <laughs> in Slovenia there is another solution, an online solution, I think in Slovenia and Croatia. In Croatia is definitely I think, an online solution. So there are a lot of different solutions in Europe and in Germany I think it's much more like um, certified software. So there is no common approach. But Austria is not leading in implementing something like this to, to ensure that uh, companies pay their taxes and receive issues? I think, my point of view, well, um, the last that's all, all these questions that have been here in the late lottery and the things you asked and on, on this policy thing. I think the technical stuff is not the complicated one. You need to put it all into perspective in the legislation. What what you just can do, what you cannot do, how the, if you do something like that, uh, you know, I would suppose if you do something like in Mexico, here in Austria, you sign every receipt, you put everything online to the Ministry of Finance, I would guess that this would not work out very well. I guess there would be a lot of uh, yeah, uh, uh, resistance to that. So I think the technical things can be signed. One thing that, that, that was, was not very easy here, um, you, need to, that's, you need to make sure, and that was the reason why, we, why these uh, trust service providers were taken, because that's on the private market. They are there, there's a complete legislation, there is a healthy market on that. Uh, so there are a lot of, of, of companies that provide you with those services. If you have to implement that on your own, and that's going to be very difficult. You need to certify it, you need to do that, that, that and all this kind of stuff. And so those were around, so this was very efficient. Are these, uh, these offers from private companies that offer a cashier, are these audited in any way? From the no, there are, there are two systems. Um, there's the open system. That's the system that most of the, the, the vendors use. So the only thing that's basically certified in there is the signature creation device. Uh -huh. So they just need to sign receipts, they implement the software, however they do it. And then there are the closed systems that are used by big companies, um, those with AT0 at the beginning. Um, and those are certified by Kirichin Sakrashen, and then uh, <coughs> they, uh, by, uh, yeah, validated. So there are not a lot of systems, they can, they can use any key they want and any mechanism they want. Uh, but they need to make sure that the software applies to the security mechanism. So there's no mechanism in place that ensures that there's no trick code that, for example, uh, issues a fake QR code every seventh receipt and does not put it in. The security is based on this, on the, the chain and also on the public appearance of the receipt. 
So if, if, yes, if but if, if, you, if you fake a QR, QR code and you, you, for example, put Google's signature in there, you, you as yeah, a private would... citizen are not able to no. check it. So if every seventh or fifth receipt does not appear in the chain, no one would notice. Yeah, but uh, someday if there is some strange thing happening, then this company would be checked, and you would see that in the in the that if if someone yeah, can that if the if the cash register yeah, does but if there is fake work on that, and somebody not public but the Ministry of Finance or something sees that QR code, then that's a highly uh, yeah yes, but what how likely is that event? I mean, <laughs> it's just I, I, I cannot, risk calculation. I, 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 I wouldn't, I'm not able to tell you that. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> so, but there is no system in place that audits the cash that would be more. That would, <laughs> that would be very, very costly. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons doing it that way because, whew, validating and certifying every software, software update. Whew. <laughs> And yeah. Could it be done in an open source way? Yeah, you need to ask that the cash register vendors. I'm not sure if they want to open source all that software. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, the AP0, like when you just have to have a guarantee for software, then you go. Yeah, but those are only a couple of companies, big companies. They pay to do that and they pay for that. And they don't want to have an open source software. <laughs> not at all. But it could be something that the Ministry of Finance provides, for example. Yes. They could, they could uh, enforce everyone to use open source software to a certain standard. Or maybe ACID has a reference implementation. No, the, 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 no. this one here, the, the crypto part is the most, the simplest yes, part of the cash system. That's the only one minor part you need to consider all the other legislation, what you need to put, there is another data protocol, where you need to store all the information on what you sell, how you do it, on all these tags. You need to have so you have so many compliance things in the other one in this BAO in the Bundesabgabenordnung, the the security parts here and the group of parts are the yeah nuts so that, that's very easy <laughs> the other parts are much more complicated and um, that's I'm not saying this is easy but if the public sector mandates that only open source software is used for certain cash registers that would be a very it's my private opinion that would be a very let's say um, I would directly influence the market and tell a company what to do. That's, it, it, of course, you can do it in other ways, but telling a company your know how and everything, you need to open source things. No, but I think, I think you could provide a certain open source core that has certain APIs that they could still plug yeah. into without, without freaking with the transaction and signing and chaining stuff. That's, and then that's they, all they, would sell, already, they would sell yeah. the stuff that goes on top of that. That's already covered by a lot of middleware providers. There are middleware providers who do all that, who had a business opportunity there, who providing that, who providing that for free for a certain amount, all those kind of solutions are out there. That, the market has all those kind of solutions already. Yes. Similar but a bit different industry is the gambling industry, which also has mandates yeah. for providing a full source code for the random generators and so on to uh, public uh, I know the uh, registry, things. but uh, this is not public code, so it can be audited by experts, yeah. but it is not publicly known. But this is a very tight system. Um, here you have every solution. You have web solutions based on JavaScript. You have all cache registers based on firmware. You have everything out there. Server-based solution, local solutions. So auditing and providing the means to do that, what you just said, in my opinion, it's not a, uh, I didn't do an analysis on that, but I think that would be very, very costly to do that and it's very heavy to maintain. It, it would and the benefits are questionable because even if I have a certified, certified software, who tells me that I'm going to use the certified software whenever I issue a receipt? I cannot validate that. That's not possible. I can use that let's say from 6 to 8, but then from 8 to, I don't know, I switch to the other software part and do whatever I want to. So that's, you cannot validate this. Of course, yeah, if someone goes there and really sees that you're using other software, but that would be some kind of switch. Yeah, but let's say, some things like policy decisions, 
other parts, I guess, that would be too expensive to do that. My opinion. Yeah? Uh, audit the first three trust service providers. Providers got two. Choose the Joe Day root keys or whatever they call them. They are free. Uh, Currently, they are free, yeah. Why, why, you mean why they have been chosen? Yeah. They, they have not been chosen, they have been. That was their own incentive. They wanted to do this as. Yeah, if I have to do this, then I have to get a, a certain certification from, from, from Austria. Yeah, um, yeah, that's all in the EIDAS regulation. Um, that's the European uh, legislation on that. And you need to consider a lot of compliance things. Yeah. You need to have a data center, you need to have certified HSMs for providing the key material. You have a complete PKI in, in process uh, there. You need to have organizational technical processes. You're audited. All those kind of things. You don't want to do it for the cash resist only. Yeah. It's much more expensive than it, yeah. than it helps. Okay. <coughs> That's it. Questions are over. So thank you very much. Keep thinking about